I'm going to use the next hour and break it up into about 10 to 15 minute chunks. Um, so we could present, talk, present, talk, because the way we learn as humans is to be interactive with what we're, we're discovering or rediscovering. Um, a lot of you have different reasons for getting into journalism. Myself, uh, I heard a policy nerd. I'm also a policy nerd, but on the international affairs end. So talk to me about trade and economics and all of those long papers that get boring real quick. <laughs> that's, that, that's my department. Um, I'm also uh, curious, like I was one of those kids that would go down a rabbit hole someone ask a question and I'd be like, wait, but what about this? What about that? And journalism allows me to get paid for my curiosity, as Laura said. So I'm like, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is up my alley. Um, but I'm gonna to jump to some slides for a bit because solution journalism is actually helpful in tackling some of the things you're doing, but not all of the things. It's not a silver bullet. It's not applicable for everything you do, but it's applicable for some things you do. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. I usually like to start with this slide. Those of you who have had a workshop with me have seen this slide before. Um, and uh, sorry, I have two screens, so I'm looking slightly off. Uh, and this is what we as a journalism industry tends to do to our audience, tend to do to our audience. It's not purposeful. It's not one newsroom. It is just the industry overall, right? We tell our audience, everything is horrible, worse than ever. Imagine and there's not a damn thing we can do about any of it. But whatever happens, we, we can't give in to despair. Um, which is in many ways not true, right? People have agency, groups of people have agency. If there's one thing we've seen for good or for bad last year is the agency of people. So solutions journalism kind of helps define that agency in a different way. So what is it? What, is, what are we talking about here? Anytime you hear about solutions journalism, this is actually what we're talking about, this definition. Every, we're going back to this definition every time. A lot of uh, misconceptions about solution journalism actually don't even bring up this suggestion, this definition. It is rigorous, evidence-based reporting on responses to social problems. Rigorous. You look into the response, you know, how is it happening? Who's doing it? Who does it help? Who does it not help? Where does it succeed? Where does it fail? Evidence-based, prove it. If someone comes to, comes to you, a politician or an activist says, hey, this will make a difference. They need to prove it. They need to prove it about how, what's happening on the ground. It was the idea applied somewhere else? Was the philosophy applied somewhere else? And it's about the response, not just the problem. If the problem is very, easy, is very defined for your audience, you don't have to go into a 5,000 word piece about, <laughs> about the problem. Um, but you are, you're really focusing on how people are responding to the problem. That's what actually is useful to your audience as well. There's a story in New York about bed bugs. They didn't, the story is about 500 or 600 words. They didn't need to have a whole long preamble about bed bugs are bad. They're like, bed bugs are bad. <laughs> Let's go into how people are responding to bed bugs. So I say that to say solution journalism doesn't always have to be these long uh, pieces of journalism that took weeks or months or years to produce you are at an advantage because you get to see policy over time and you can go back to a lot of your older stories. So if a policy was passed, let's say housing, a certain aspect of housing, and you did that in 2018, you can say, oh, wait, no, I spoke to these 10 people. I spoke to these organizations. Let me go back and see how this is working. Is it working or is it not working? And if it is working, you're going into the evidence. You're going into the how. The second most important slide we have would be this. And I'll be sharing the slides with you after this, by the way. Um, this is how you do solution journalism well. This is how you avoid pitfalls. And again, a lot of this is really things you do already, but it really just helps you make sense of it and see it in front of you. Solution journalism features not just a person, but a response to a problem and how it happened. You know, it's not good enough to say, this one person did this one thing by themselves. We're not talking about a billionaire who just gave away money. We're not talking about, oh, look at this person who couldn't get to work so they were, doing, so they were giving a car. No, you need to talk about a systemic response to a systemic problem, how the response works or how the response didn't work. It provides available evidence of results, looking at effectiveness, not just intentions. And evidence would be 
qualitative or quantitative, and we could go into more detail about that because depending on your story, there may or may not be uh, full evidence. And usually when we do a full workshop, we can go into more details about that if asked, but I'm trying to be uh, conscious of time here. But looking at evidence, not just intentions. So again, it's not good enough for someone to say, wow, this organization meant well, this politi politician meant well. No, let's see how effective it is. Let's see how effective it's not. Uh, the example I usually use is Cleveland Plain Dealer doing their story about lead paint in, in a old housing stock. It was poisoning kids, mostly black and brown kids, because that's the discrimination in America. Um, and they decided, they asked themselves which city successfully tackled the lead poisoning problem, right? That's the question they ask. Similar housing stock, they're looking for similar housing stock, similar demographics, who had this problem and no longer has this problem. And they sent journalists to do research in different cities and they came back with about three cities. But the one that really made a difference was Rochester, which had a similar housing stock, but was but successfully lowered the poisoning rate um, in, let, uh, in children. So that's what we mean by evidence, because they came back, they looked at the evidence over time, they looked at the evidence that made a difference, they spoke to local journalists, local health departments, and they said, hey, you know, there are ways to solve this that aren't that expensive, you just have to change the process. Um, and they went, took it back to Cleveland and say, hey, what is your excuse now? You said it was too expensive, it was done cheaply in these places. You said it was too hard, it was done just by a change in process in these places. So it was used on it as a tool for accountability. Solution journalism seeks to provide insights that can help others respond to not just inspiration. You know, not just uh, you're inspired to do this. Different policies, different responses. And I say responses because all responses aren't policy or state house, right? It's community, uh, NGOs, churches, just groups of people responding. Ask yourself, why did this response work or why did this fail? You know, what made this thing tick? I remember in about if I remember it, like early 2000s, there were a lot of programs made for immigrants and they were failing because there was a language component that was not built in, right? The ones that were successful, the insight that made it work was that language component. You have to have that in there. Another insight for some programs is it has to meet people where they are and be culturally adapted. That insight, when taken, makes you understand why and how a response works or feels. And lastly, discuss, discusses limitations and avoids reading like a puff piece. No piece, no response is a silver bullet. We all know this. We all have been journalists for a while. That being said, you want to talk about what it works on and what it helps and what it doesn't help. My, my mentor, uh, Linda Belarusa, did a story about infant mortality in Black women, right? So thinking about data that shows things that don't work, things that don't work, things that don't work. One of, the, one of her stories in that series actually focused on doulas. Why did she focus on doulas? Because specifically, despite all of the things that were working against African-American women giving birth, doulas were having better outcomes. So the story said, hey, this is what better looks like. This is why it works. This is the evidence for it. It doesn't solve systemic racism in the health department. But it makes a difference for these people in this point, and we need to know why, and others need to know how it works. So that's what we mean by discusses limitations and avoids reading like a puff piece. Uh, I just gave some, I just gave some pretty broad examples, but I, again, for time, I'm just trying to have you think about this differently. Before I move on, I say this in most of my trainings. I think I started saying this in Dallas. So for the person who was in the Dallas Morning News, may have gotten this. Uh, this note, but when you're doing these stories, always recognize where the solutions come from, who they help and who they don't help, and who are you centering in the story. I've seen journalists focus on solutions journalism, but it's never centered closest to the people most affected or closest to the people actually implementing the solution. It also intersects with our bias. Who do we think gives a valid solution or who we think doesn't? So an example I give is, and Stefan knows this because we, we worked in Harlem together, one of the great things about Harlem is that its wealth was built by the Black church, right? So you think about the history of African-Americans being out of the banking system. So African-Americans responded to that problem systemically, step by step, not by luck, 
not by wow, this just happened and built something despite things not happening. So that's an example of you're centering the story of the people who are most affected responding to the problem and not talking about it from an outside organization coming in. People are always responding to their problems no matter what the scale is. And it's always good to ask that question. And again, you're, you're on very tight deadlines, but, you, but your advantage is looking at how policy affects people and how people are responding to that policy as well. So you have the advantage of retrospectives. You have the advantage of taking a step back and looking at your city over time or your uh, state over time in a way others don't, especially when you can have a narrow focus like housing, well, narrow relatively, but like housing or healthcare, and you could go, or transportation, you could go on and on and on. I'll rem be remiss if I don't mention this slide here. Oh wait, I hope this slide was showing when I was speaking, but this is these were the four points I was talking about. <laughs> Just quick thumbs up. Was this a slide that was up while I was speaking? Okay. <sighs> um, but I'll be remiss if I don't show this slide here. These, I will not necessarily call bad journalism, but they're not solution of journalism. And they're fine, some of these are fine stories to do, but I just wanna make that distinction. If you're hearing a lot, um, sirens in the background, by the way, that's the natural songs of Brooklyn. Um, so you may hear those random noises of every now and again. Um, so hero worship, hero worship just says, this person is awesome. They do great things. They went through hardship and they're awesome. You can do those stories. Nothing's wrong with those stories, but they're not solution to journalism because if you actually had the same problem that hero had, you will have no idea how it was fixed or how it was responded or what you could learn from it. Um, it's not public relations. Public relations will always come and say, this thing is awesome, nothing's wrong with it, go buy this. You know, We're asking you to go into evidence, go into limitations, talk about the things that are not working in this project. It's not an afterthought. Um, I gave the, uh, the bed bug story example. If you did, a, there's no reason to do 90% of the story as saying bed bugs are bad. And the last line saying, yeah, but this city doesn't have bed bugs and walk away. Like that's not helpful. We're asking you to flip that dynamic in solution stories. Think tanks are a good place to get information if you're doing these longer enterprise stories, but they're not solution stories in and of itself because you wanna know where the rubber hits the road. Politicians will always say, well, this think tank suggests this will work and this will work, and they suggest this will work. We're saying, hey, look at where those policies have implemented and how, Oh, and what are the outcomes of that? Housing is an example of a bunch of think tanks given gives say, this will work, this will work, this will work in theory. But there are so many aspects of housing and so many places trying different things. It's actually not that hard to call up a housing reporter in a city and say, hey, is this working as well as you say it is? What are the caveats to this thing that you may not even realize are happening? Um, I mentioned nothing is a silver bullet. It's not activism, but I'm gonna put an asterisk next to that. And the only reason I'm putting on asterisk is we have a plethora of newsrooms on this call. Some newsrooms see themselves as activists and other newsrooms don't. Um, and again, taking a step back and looking at the historical context, the black press were activists for the black community by default. And we need to remember that. Uh, and a lot of journalists who are focusing on these deep investigative pieces about problems actually want change, you know? So again, I would say in general, journalists are probably activists for a better world, but usually that's a red uh, a red railing that I like to talk about, but I don't have time to talk about it right now, but I really want to mention it. Solution journalism in and of itself is not activism. It is using those same journalistic tools to investigate what's working, just like how we investigate what's not working. And it's not popular opinion. It's not just going around saying, what do you think will work? What do you think will work? What do you think will work? Because again, that has no evidence, that has no um, on the ground conversation. It is just someone's opinion. Again, opinions are important, but opinions aren't based in um, research. So I'm gonna take a pause right here and take some questions before going to the second half of the slide. So any questions? That was, I just put like a, a lot in. <laughs> four slides. Any questions, thoughts, concerns, pushback?
this is the point where I say I used to be a, yeah. a college adjunct, so I have no problem pointing at people and asking <laughs> what they think. Yeah. Uh, yes, Anna. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. One of the is there a specific website or resource for um, what I usually go to the N NCLIS, I believe it's called the. Uh, for resources on other what other states have been doing with policy. There's a proposal being moved around in the legislature that is a big priority of the governor that would that was done in response to the Black Lives Matter. And he's trying to enhance a lot of existing criminal statutes to crack down on protesters like walking roads and um, just Thing would be considered a riot if it's three people or more intimidating people. Um, and one of the issues that I've had, you know, there's a lot of criticism, especially because it was proposed right after the summer of unrest last year. And there's obviously it's a lot of heated discussions, but I feel like this would be a great opportunity to do something like this if looking at maybe crime rates and similar states or other proposals that have been done because they're doing it in the name of law and order mm -hmm. but i'm not sure how that would be a solution so. yeah i there, there's so many ways to unpack that and this is not my forte so i'll start with that about like where do you look i mean you can ask different questions of the experts you're already interviewing um but as a unique place to look uh i am unsure but the funny thing about law and order policies, whether we like them or not, no matter where you're on the spectrum, I always find it interesting that there's an assumption by people who talk about law and order, and it's a disconnect between what they want to do and what they want to accomplish. <laughs> you know, cracking down harder almost never works. In, like in my international journalism world, that has almost never works, right? Like that's a consistent thing. You could call up someone who does not international and national security. They would say, hey, that never works. And they would give you a bunch of data about that, right? Um, but that's what I mean by asking a different question of the experts because they're deep in this. Ask them, do things like this work? And what actually works <laughs> when it comes to these things? But also to a more fundamental question, which is not a solution to some question, but to your point, why is this happening? Who is this help? Who does this not help? Who, how do they apply these laws to begin with? Because part of the problem when it comes to race and policing is that laws, which even may be good on paper, are applied disproportionately as well. So usually when I'm doing brainstorming sessions, I could go into more detail, but like those are the kind of questions I would ask in that setting. Uh, I saw Fowler had his hand up, followed by uh, Bernard. Yeah, can you just elaborate a little bit more about uh, what you talked about, about afterthought not being an example of solutions journalism? Uh, it just like, I guess what, what you would consider like afterthought and if that is related to, so oftentimes a lot of like revelatory stories about things are done after the fact and like how you can bring in solutions journalism to something that is, already happened that was bad or wrong? Or are those two separate things? Uh, can you rephrase the question? So oh, like, I, 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 yeah, go ahead. I guess, yeah, what, what, do, you, what do you mean, uh, I guess a little more about how like an afterthought isn't an example of solutions journalism? Oh, sure. So in this case, by afterthought, I mean, it's like writing a thousand words and saying, policing in America sucks. And then in your last line, you say, um, Camden, New York doesn't have this problem. And then you walk away. Like you end the story, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, you can write a story like that, but that's not solutions to journalism, especially if your city or your town has that same problem and they can learn something from Camden. What we're asking and saying is when you're doing a solution story, say, hey, we recognize policing sucks on for these 25 reasons. This is something Camden does right that we should actually consider or look into or think about. Like, that's what I mean by the afterthought. Don't just kick it to the side and say, hey, this is not a problem somewhere else. Or we can learn something from somewhere. Really go into the detail and the useful meat of the story. Okay. And then I guess the other thing then, uh, I feel like too many times a lot of the like big impactful stories are like kind of uh, dissections or, or like um, 
autopsies of things that went wrong and how to fix it. But how do you get stories, solution stories more like in real time when there's big issues being discussed or problems or things like that? So real time is relative because it depends on the type of story. So, and I say relative because I think about the, the cahoots program that is in different parts of the country, just to stay with the policing discussion that um, was brought up. That was started years ago, I think like probably 20 years ago. And every year things changed. They updated it, they tweaked it, it got better. Some things didn't work, some things started to work. So in one way, if you are focusing, if your focus is policing, for example, and that's your beat, you can write those updates, right? So that's real time, but that's not like today for tomorrow. It's a different type of real time. If it's a policy has been proposed and the vote is coming up on it next week, doing a res doing research or asking experts about, hey, has this policy worked somewhere else? Where did you get the idea from? How was it implemented? That's a different type of real time before the vote comes up. And that's an important real time because the story you can create out of that is telling your audience and saying, hey, this type of policy was created in response to this kind of thing. And we've looked into where this policy has been applied and it works well or it's bullshit or it needs to, or it only works under certain circumstances. There may be some nuance in there as well. So that's a different word, a different way of real time. I have a slide later that talks about questions that you don't have to ask those, those specific questions, but the most useful question there is asking an expert who's doing this better or what does better look like? And chances are that just leads you down a totally different rabbit hole that we avoid. Because usually when we have an expert, we ask them, what is the problem? Why it's a problem? And we dissect the problem. Even though that same expert, chances are, may actually know what a better version looks like and where it exists. Is that helpful? Thank you. All right, uh, Bernard, then Gibbons, and then um, I'm just going to move forward with some slides and take more questions. So when you're talking about, you know, doing stories, evaluating, the, you know, the effectiveness of some solutions, is there a good benchmark for how long to give a solution to be in place before you start looking at how it did? Yes and no. So I say yes because different outlets have different um, editorial sensibilities, I would say, um, and different comfort levels, and quite frankly, different connections to the community as well. So like if, you are with, if you're deep in the community you're reporting on, chances are it's not something that's new to you. It just may be new to like a state newspaper or a city newspaper that doesn't cover that community well. So I, I wanna recognize new is also relative. In the example of the Cahoots um, project um, it, or system, I should say, or program, it depends on the news organization. Again, someone will say, I wanna wait a year. Someone may say, you know what? I just wanna write about it as, this community is trying a thing and we don't know what the results are yet. And I bring up that example because it's lacking evidence, but one of the large problems that, that we recognized last year, we recognized it like for decades, but we recognized last year is that, com is that communities in the same city have deficit mindsets of other communities because they think the community is not trying to help themselves or, or serve their problem or help their problems or resist their problems. So sometimes it's just good to say, hey, you know, if you checked Eventbrite, there were more events uh, and marches about stopping black on black crime, quote unquote. And we know that's not a problem because of statistics, but there were more events in the community trying to stop that <laughs> than you even realize. But what you see on the news, on your nightly television news, tells a different story. So again, there's a whole deeper conversation about editorial, about when you want to jump in. Um, but the rule of thumb we say is um, tell people how far along the response is, tell people what you know, and tell people what you don't know. Uh, and Gibbons. I don't know why I'm calling people's last name like, a, like, like I'm a teacher. <laughs> There's like, three, there's like three Lauras and Laurens on, on our fellowship, <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> Actually helpful. Um, so I would love some suggestions on... Um, how to perhaps turn into solutions journalism on, on certain policy matters um, that I cover. I find it like every expert I could possibly call in the subject area, mm -hmm. all are saying this is what would help. And then you get like one lawmaker or someone in, in the process who's just like, you know, 
I've heard those things and I don't really, I'm not interested. There's usually like one guy like road blocking it. And so in terms of, and so I've written a lot of stories like, yes, everyone is saying this, but there's a reason that it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And is there a way to like apply the solutions journalism concept, maybe like through, you know, what other states are doing or to kind of maybe turn it from like, yeah, this is a great idea, but because one lawmaker doesn't like it, it's never going to happen. Um, I think you, you're, you're right on the money as is. I mean, sometimes the reality is the limitation is just political will. You know, what, 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 what we're seeing with solution journalism is, you know, reflect that too, you know, don't just reflect everything is terrible, but sometimes there's a solid response and political will is the real limitation or obstacle. And that's, the reality that we live in. So I would say you're doing it right in many ways as is. Uh, oh, I see, I see two more questions or one more question. Uh, Kashinsky. Hi, um, I don't did, know. Did I pronounce your name correctly? You did. <laughs> um, not many people do, so that's great, thank you. Um, but um, yeah, basically, I was wondering if you have any suggestions and if you want to tackle this at the end, that's fine, too. Um, I've kind of said on this a lot that our vaccine rollout in Massachusetts is having a lot of problems. And I'd love to know some ways to dig into that from a more solutions journalism angle as opposed to just reporting everything that's going wrong. Like we're trying to, you know, get the different ways and ways that it can be fixed. But I'd love to know ways, you know, any suggestions you have of how to dig into that or anything with COVID from a little bit more of that solutions journalism standpoint. Sure, uh, I can address that question after the slides because I think the slides may yep. actually clarify some things. Sounds good, thanks. Okay, uh, before I start showing the next slides, Kevin, do you have any anything you want to add for any of the questions you've, you've just heard? Thanks. One thing I was just starting to type into the chat, so I appreciate you asking. Um, one way that solutions journalism can be really effective when it comes to political will is by almost shaming um, leaders, right? By saying, hey, the neighboring community, the neighboring state is doing this so much better and explaining how effective it might be nearby. And we all know how those kinds of rivalries can be. And that sometimes a solution story can almost be a roadmap that a legislature can bring into the process, right? And point to and say, why aren't we getting this right? Um, so that would be one, one thing to perhaps think about um, when it comes to trying to sort of move something that feels uh, immovable. Uh, yeah, agreed, Kevin. The, the Cleveland example I mentioned um, did move the needle. It changed the... the, the it changed the conversation. Uh, some people got fired, some people stepped down. As we all know, journalists, all journalism pieces don't do that, right? <laughs> so even problem focused ones don't do it. So I don't want to over promise by any means. But yeah, the way they framed it was um what's your what's your what's your problem? What's your real problem? Like that's literally the way they framed it. What's your real problem when there are ways to respond to that? Uh Connecticut also, Connecticut Mirror, I think, did one or two stories that were like mentioned in legislative changes made uh, because of the roadmap example, right? They're like, this is why this other place is similar to us. Um, this is how they responded to it. Let's talk about that as opposed to just saying it can't be done and having that roadblock there. Again, it's not a silver bullet by any means, but we've definitely seen it used like that. So some tips, right? We think about this, we think about this really quickly. Um, it's best if you define the problem as precisely as possible. Again, we can have 10,000 different levels of re reproductive health, be more specific. And sometimes, as with the example I, I mentioned with Linda Villarosa, sometimes we may say, well, that's so small, it's not really making a big difference. But the fact is when you think about these slices, these slices really do make a difference in people's lives. You know, Teen pregnancy makes a difference. Uh, C-section rates make a difference. Access to contraception makes a difference. Those are life-changing uh, decisions and policies. So don't dismiss something because you may think it's too small or too precise because there are millions of people it affects. It also helps um, evaluate a response. You know, like what is the response really trying to fix and what is not trying to fix as well. Uh, you get the sources in the same place you get your sources already. 
databases, academic uh, reviews, people you speak to on the streets, uh, I mean, in your, in, in your work, um, foundations, the same people you reach out to. Um, but when you reach out to them, really, as you suggest also asking them um, a solutions focused question, not just the problems focused questions. Uh, I mentioned about earlier, who's doing it better makes such a difference. Even if it's just the last question you ask in an interview, talking about how things are wrong, how these policies are bad, who's doing it better probably leads you to a place um, on the ground about how a response is working or not working in a very tactile way. And again, experts who study this probably know this at the top of their head anyway, because it's the thing they talk about. Um, and you could look at these other questions as well. What does the research say? What do critics say? And I would add at critics part, what do valid critics say? Not all critics are valid. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about the New Jersey bail reform that happened or, or has been happening over the last three years, I think. The biggest critics were bail bondsmen and the bail bondsmen said, bail reform will cause violence in the streets in New Jersey um, if this passes. Uh, that didn't happen again. So we know that because of evidence and obviously bail bondsmen, bail bondsmen economy, uh, bail bondsmen's business was affected because they make money off of high bail uh, charges. So understanding why people are critics, uh, critics are, uh, is important. Uh, Kevin, any of these uh, questions you wanna highlight or you wanna point out? Uh, let's see. So I, yeah, I mean, I kind of already covered a little bit about who's doing it better and is it being replicated elsewhere? Um, you know, the point about the critics and what do they say? I think, Mikhail, you said something earlier about how sort of a critical eye is so important when we come into solutions journalism. In other words, right, not every solutions piece is, and hopefully none of them are puff pieces, are, you know, as you said, uh, silver bullets. Um, sometimes you're going to take um, a careful look at a potential solution and actually find that it's not working, right? So sometimes the critics are going to be valid. Sometimes you're going to come away with a piece that um, really doesn't have a favorable view on, on a, a solution that's being implemented. And I found that to be sort of in one way, that's the most frustrating kind of solution story, because in some ways, perhaps you were hoping it might work. But then, you know, the critical aspect of all of our work as journalists is, you know, if, if the numbers don't add up, if the sort of talking points of leaders don't match the actual results um, on the ground, um, you have a problem. Um, really more accurately, the, the implementers of the solution have a problem. So I think, um, you know, as was said before as well, sort of acknowledging what you know, what's there, what does the data say, what we don't know because sometimes a solution story is going to say, well, here's the data we have, here's how this solution performed over the first one year, two years, three years, um, but really, you know, experts say um, it's gonna take five or 10 years to know if this is truly a sustainable solution. So just taking every single chance you can as a reporter to sort of kick the tires, scrub and vet to make sure that the solution that you might be putting forward in your story um, really does hold water. Yeah, and I'd like to add, um, I, I consider it a win-win when you go down that road because you either find out something works and like that's an amazing solution story or you find out that something has failed uh, but people are still pushing it um, or somebody's cooking the books and that's a hell of a corruption story <laughs> too. They claim a thing works and you're like, yeah, I looked into that response, it didn't work. Write that story too. So that's super important. And just asking a different question will help you start to discover some of these, some of these holes. The one thing I, I want to say before switching the slide is um, the third to last question, uh, what metrics matter when it comes to measuring success? Um, since we started with the policing examples, <laughs> that, that, that example set the tone. Um, an example of this is when a local police department says arrests are up so we are doing our job, but arrest actually doesn't measure if crime is down. So you see that discrepancy there, right? So the thing that they're peddling as a measurement of success 
may that really be a measurement of success, depending what you're talking about as well. So even just asking yourself what metrics matter when it comes to measuring success is helpful. Education has a <laughs> has a lot of those, right? Things that are like, yeah, graduation rate, but like, are they prepared for college? Like thing, things like that come up. So those are important questions to ask. Um, also think about this small slice. Um, what does success mean? Is it is something faster or cheaper or more equitable? Uh, or give people more access. There are different ways to think about success because there are different ways to think about, quite frankly, failure. Um, a lot of times it's pedal that Canada has long waiting times to go to the doctor um, and England as well, right? So it's not fast enough, but they have much more uh, equitable distribution of healthcare and much easier access, right? So again, what are you, at, what are you actually thinking about when you define success? Especially if you have like a politician at the state house who's talking and someone mentions Canada, it's like, well, do you want to wait two hours to see a doctor? It's like, well, compared to not ever seeing a doctor, period, <laughs> like that's a different question, right? Time versus access. So it adds much more nuance to the story. And one of the only pieces of self promotion we'll do today for Social Journalism Network is our story tracker. Um, it's a database of stories from all over the world, free to use. You could sign up and just use it, um, name and email, and you're good to go. And it's stories that have the four qualities, as I mentioned before, in varying degrees. And I say varying degrees because platform makes a difference. A three-minute radio piece is different than a documentary, which is different than an Atlantic article, which is different than an 800-word piece. So that's what I mean by varying degrees. Um, and you could just search by issue area, a news outlet, location of the response, the type of uh, platform the response was done on. Um, you could switch by topic. Uh, as you could see, we have uh, over a thousand stories about different aspects and different responses of COVID-19. Uh, and stories that have the four qualities make it in there. And it's free to use for other journalists, researchers, students, policymakers, anyone could see it and check it out. And if you're doing a story about a response, it's a good place just to see what other people wrote about it. Uh, and you may have an update about it too. Maybe something was working in 2015 and the environment changed, the geography changed, demographics changed, uh, will change, and that response isn't working as well. Or maybe it's working better, but it helps you think about follow-up stories as well. So I just want to highlight that it's the Solution Journalism Story Tracker. So, all right, this is where, stop sharing screen again. We're in a half an hour mark. Any questions? And I know we had uh, one more, we had a question earlier about vaccines and COVID-19 coverage. Uh, who was that? I just wanna make sure I have that person. Yeah. Hi, it was me, Lisa from the Boston Herald. All right, awesome. Um, can you ask that question again or rephrase it from what you just, you just saw? I wanna make sure I get get to you. Yeah. Um, basically, I was just looking for any advice of ways to dig into our uh, coronavirus vaccine rollout, because um, there's a lot of issues with, um, let's say like that are to kind of sum it up quickly, our state is focusing a lot on mass vaccination sites, which is leaving out a lot of um, you know, lower income communities, people who don't have transportation, um, communities of color, which are the hardest hit communities in the state. There's a lot of uproar about it. Um, there's a lot of letters being sent in our state house to try and fix it. Um, the governor, you know, says that they're putting more resources into these communities, but I want to figure out how to cover, you know, how effective that will be as, as you just talked about and other things that I could maybe dig into to figure out the effectiveness of the state's vaccine rollout. Awesome, thank you. So I'm gonna do the, uh, the teacher thing and ask that question to everyone. What do, you, what do you all think? How would you respond to Lisa? This is a little space, your, by the way, so you don't have to get it perfectly right. Sorry, go ahead. To your point, I mean, I think you can look at how other cities and other states are doing this. Is anyone handling the mass vaccination rates better? Uh, and I think there are also some places, depending on the demographics of the place, where mass more mass vaccination sites may be considered more equitable. So it might not be the 
method that's the problem as much as where the sites of mass vaccinations are happening. But yeah, I would definitely want to co compare what other places are doing. Um, here, here in Pennsylvania, we've done like the opposite, which is it's all decentralized with very, very little mass vaccination. Um, and a part of the problem is I think our numbers are skewed because Philadelphia, which has our most uh, the biggest black population in Pennsylvania, its numbers are not separate from Pennsylvania's numbers. But we had a quote issue here too with uh, just trying to do it distributed. Uh, so it seems like uh, it's very much a, it's like it's a problem in every state, no matter the method that's being chosen. This isn't really um, advice, just more of a comment. I feel like throughout this vaccination campaign, officials have talked about outreach in a way that is very poorly defined. Like, what does outreach mean? Who are you reaching out to? And, you know, does social media outreach or in-person outreach work and correlate to vaccination rates? I think I just... I, I wish I knew more about, I wish I knew more background when they talk about the importance of outreach um, and disparities in vaccination rates, which is, I think, your original topic, Lisa. Yeah, I'd love to be able to figure out, they're doing a lot now with, oh yeah, we're doing outreach, we're doing outreach, but I, I'm trying to find a metric or a way to figure out how to how effective that actually is because I don't think it's very effective so far, but I don't know how to kind of prove that in a story yet. We, um, in South Carolina, we have terrible broadband issues. Um, thousands pump out, like I'm sure in many other states and rural areas too, thousands of South Carolinians don't have access to the internet. Um, and so one of the ways that we've tried to, oh, and also they may not have access to email. We have a lot of seniors who don't send emails, so they don't even really have a really great way to sign up for vaccines. So one way that we have, um, we didn't do it with a recent story that we just posted about rural vaccine clinics, but one of the ways that we've tried to do it is find like a family and um, obviously COVID socially distanced, masked up, all of that, but follow them for a day and see like, did they see any commercials on TV at all during the day? If they are on Facebook, are they, are they like, do they like any, you know, social media pages for our public health agency here? Are they following anybody? So just like kind of capturing it through them. And to me, that has been a better way to kind of figure out like, are people actually seeing this outreach? Did they get a knock on the door? Did they get a flyer? Like we have our public uh, health agency here has been saying that they keep, you know, uh, putting ads in stories in like the Spanish speaking newspaper. And we've seen like one. <laughs> which is ridiculous. Um, and uh, they keep talking about how they are putting ads into black owned newspapers in South Carolina, but it's been very spotty. And so if you don't pick up the newspaper regularly or ever, or if you pick it up one day over the next week or whatever, you miss it completely. Um, so trying to like start with the person and kind of go about their day or go through the week with them has been something super helpful. And that's kind of shown us that the outreach has been very spotty. Thanks. And without getting into like bigger projects and stuff like that, but there are newsrooms who would say, you know what, I want to work with my community and have them like message me or send a WhatsApp message every time they actually see one of these things um, or in different communities and see how often people ping you. So that's you generating your own data from your audience. That's like if you're thinking project wise, which you may not be, but I wanted to float that idea there. But you'll actually have a really good advantage being in this fellowship because you can always call up or send an email to everyone else in the group and say, hey, how are you responding to this thing? <laughs> and you just have a lot of knowledge coming from a lot of different places. And you can jump on a call and ask other journalists and experts, hey, what is relevant here? Or what is not relevant here? Because those are real questions to bring up as well. The one thing I would just mention, mention about communicating so there are real barriers when it comes to vaccine communication with vaccine hesitancy, right? Like I can list a whole bunch, like real and perceived barriers, I should say. Um, but I'm thinking about like the census, which is done every 10 years and the outreach they do, like how much outreach they do to get people to respond to the census. In New York City, one of the largest um, 
response rates came from a neighborhood called Co- the Co-op City, which is basically the largest projects in the country, which historically has bad census response rate, but they actually had a good one last year in the middle of a pandemic, right? Their outreach strategy was off the wall, right? Hence, they had one of their largest response rates. So depending on the type of question you're asking or you're looking at, you may want to say, what could we learn from these different institutions currently or historically when it comes to reaching communities that they don't usually reach? Um, And that's a real important question you may want to ask as well. That may be helpful. It's learning from different um, subject areas and specialties. And um, yeah, you can also, like recently I wrote a story, uh, actually this week, about the about activists and lawyers not really well they're not happy with the low numbers of people submitting uh declarations of um income uh you regarding paying rent because you know the uh moratorium comes up they want people to get that ahead of time so they won't have to go to ev- to eviction court and that's something the city is supposed to be pushing too. And the state's supposed to be pushing. And they're not really pushing that. Is and it's been up to community activists to do it, which and it, it the burden shouldn't be on them. So I'm gonna continue, you know, working on that and seeing if the uh city or the state could uh, answer because I've I've sent them questions, I've called them, I've gotten zero response. So now I have to be, you know, to fly in, in, in a buttermilk and just sort of, <laughs> and, and just keep harassing them and harassing them until they answer me. But, you know, like I said, the burden shouldn't be on the organizers to run around and get the word out. It's also interesting in a place like New York City where you know local government can't get the word out because you could give 10 examples of them bombarding with a bunch of different things. <laughs> so it's any not like they time, don't know how to do time, it. Any, any other time, anything else, yeah. they'll flood the market with it. But if it's something that's really important that the people need, you'll barely see it. Yeah, and that's like, that's embarrassing to a politician, right? It's like, you know how to do this, you're not doing this. I just prove that you're not doing it with numbers and different campaigns. <laughs> Fight me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I want to just shift a little bit, but I just wanted to say, like, those are the type of questions you'll ask when you're brainstorming this, and you have that advantage of having the knowledge of the crowd. In this case, you know, people in different communities in different parts of the country, rural versus urban versus suburban, coastal versus interior. Like, just asking and figuring out what's outside of your bubble, uh, because maybe there is something that's useful. Maybe there's not, but it wouldn't hurt to just send a quick email and ask. Um, all right, uh, Ethan, you had a question. Your hand has been up for a while. Let's exercise. Hey, I, I do have a big picture question, but if you want to get to more slides, I can wait till after. It's kind of, yeah. Um, no, let's take the question. Okay, so, I, um, so Lauren had asked, she talked earlier about kind of the political process, how often that kind of can get in the way of a, of a particular solution. I wanted to kind of expand on that in certain areas where there's like a lot of ideology involved um, in a, my state this year, that would be school choice, for instance, um, the, you know, the idea of a school voucher program where pretty much everybody you talk to is, you know, it's, they, they can seem to be deeply entrenched in one side or another and kind of, um, have their own biases and look at all the data in a in like a through their lens that would make um, you know their side look the best. So when you talk to people on both sides, you just tend to get like a trend between them. I'm wondering what within the kind of lens of solutions journalism, how do you break through that when you're trying to get to the kind of ground truth of what's going on? Well, I saw that that ground truth name drop there. <laughs> Kev, I'm going to ask you to answer that, but uh, I just want to bring up two important things, because Kev, obviously, co-founder, and he works in this realm a lot more than I do. Um, But as a particular your question through solution journalism, there are things solution journalism does well, and there are things that it doesn't do well in this case, right? So again, our limitation with what what we do, because it's not a silver bullet. You can write a story, balanced all the data, all the information, 
about a problem and people will be divided. You can write a story about the response to the problem and people will still be divided. It doesn't solve people's division. It makes them, it makes them more informed about the options they have, solution journalism, but people have a bias, right? And people are ingrained for different reasons. Um, that said, SJN has a side project, I like to call it, called Complicating the Narratives. And it's about what we, what journalists can learn about reporting in deeply dividing conflicts, right? Like people are just entrenched on these things and they don't wanna even listen to each other. And one of the things the mediators told us is that as journalists, we often don't get to the actual, the heart of the problem, if that makes sense. We get to the outcome of the problem. We get to the position, but we never get to the motivation. And I would recommend that when you're doing these stories, if you have time, again, I understand I've on a time crunch, but if you have time, ask questions that get to people's motivation. Like, why are you so entrenched on this? If this changes, what does this mean for you? Um, we have an entire blog post about questions that can really start cutting underneath that. But you can't do a useful solution of Jones on Peace if you don't understand what the real heart of the problem is. And education is really interesting because there are education stories where there are real players who don't mean well. <laughs> and there are education stories that where Everybody means well. Everybody wants the best for their kid, but it just doesn't align. And if we write those stories, like one person's a good guy, one person's a bad guy, we're actually missing the motivation of people's stance in a lot of things. Uh, so I'll add that to the resource list after. Uh, we go into more detail about that, but that's the kind of thing that we need to do when you're writing about it. People need to see themselves in a story in order to, people need to feel heard in order to start listening. And if we write a story about conflict and we have caricatures, people are less likely to even listen to what we're saying. Uh, Kevin. Thanks. And I just want to echo that uh, the whole concept around uh, complicating the narrative that SJN has been defining is brilliant. It's well worth doing the reading. Um, there's a long essay actually that you can read that you'll have the link for that really explains what does that mean. Um, one thing that we've just found in practice with, at Ground Truth is that you, we've ended up sort of earning the respect of audience members by respecting them in sharing the nuance of the story, right? To try to oversimplify, uh, ultimately can dumb down what are complicated human problems. And then like Mikhail says, then the person you've just talked to doesn't see themselves in the story because it's sort of like, that's not what I told you. Right? I told you something much more nuanced. And then what you put in the story was super, super oversimplified. Um, we actually did a project in 2017 um, in partnership with SJN and some other partners, and we called it Crossing the Divide. Um, we brought together um, a group of journalism fellows um, who actually you know, literally traveled from one coast to the other. And they spent time in different communities in uh, what it was Kentucky and Minnesota. Um, they were in uh, Montana, California, um, and Massachusetts. So I just did it in, not in the right order. Um, but trying to sort of report on specific beats or issues that um, we hoped that we could bring together different community members on. Um, so it might be sort of the management of forestry, right? Or uh, Native American issues, um, education, right? Places where lots of people care a lot, um, but don't necessarily agree on solutions. So we paired our reporting and tried to sort of do that sort of complicate the narrative reporting, longer features, more complexity in the pieces um, with actual events where we brought together people from a broad swath of the community, right? Um, and so these you know, very diverse groups of community members would sit down and talk about these complex issues with our journalists as moderators. Um, honestly, one of the key takeaways that we got from basically every event was most of the people in the room didn't trust journalists. Um, they, they were skeptical of even coming. Many were skeptical of even joining the events because they were being moderated by journalists. And the only reason that most people came to these events is because other people in the community that they respected were going. So our invite lit process was sort of like convincing an influencer in the community first. And they said, sure, I'll be there. 
um, and then going to somebody else and saying, well, you know, so-and-so is going to be there and we'd really love for you to be there. And so word spread, spread rather quickly. Um, we also did uh, potlucks and food sharing at these events. So that's always a nice way to bring people together. Um, but just all getting to that, that, I guess the point I'm trying to make is agree on the complexity, uh, taking the time wherever possible um, to make sure that people are being heard and not trying to sort of prevent, uh, present uh, cookie cutter solutions we found was helpful. And then all of that said, the biggest thing that Ground Truth learned from doing the Crossing the Divide project was that our resources were better spent helping to support positions like the ones that all of you have. Um, that, that doing a project even over three months, even if the project had been six months or a year, would not be as effective as a full-time reporter working in a community, right? As um, you know, somebody covering um, these key issues, being a real human being, who especially in times that are not COVID, um, you know, is, is someone that, that folks can meet. Um, and that almost that ambassadorial role of the journalist uh, can be a really powerful thing. Uh, so anyway, I, I've ranted long enough, but those are some of the things that, we, that we've thought about in, in sort of building trust and trying to overcome some, some polarization through journalism. Yeah, there, there's an outlet in Philadelphia called Fun Times, small magazine focused on the Black diaspora. Um, so think Afro-Caribbean, African, African-American, just whole Black shebang. And they wanted to do a solution story about the divisions within the community, right? The tensions within the community. And they use complicating the narrative to better understand what those tensions were and why they exist. This is a magazine within the community. This is lived experiences, so they're not flying in. But it's very easy to stay colonization, institutional racism, imperialism, like that doesn't really explain or get close to the person who's actually being the perpetrator or the recipient or the victim. And that switches, by the way, in this conversation, unless you actually get people to talk about things like say, you know, this comes from my mother always saying something about that deals with shadism or me watching on TV that Africa is like this, right? <laughs> like you needed to have those people talk about their bi where their biases came from or how, why they felt how they felt in order to even do a solution story because anything with, with beyond that would have just been a good story, but it wouldn't have been a useful story, if that makes sense. So that's one way they use the complicated the narrative to come to, to get to a relative of valid solution story. And that is not always necessary, but that's how they did it. So I just wanted to marry those two things together. <clears throat> Anyone else? Any other questions? Ethan, your hand is still up, by the way. <laughs> uh, Mikhail, I'm just yeah. uh, wondering on time, uh, are we still go going to breakout rooms? No, I was about, I was just about to suggest that we just okay. continue with questions and then sure. we, we step away. And I saw a question about um, enterprise in the chat, enterprise reporting. Can someone, the person who put that in, jump off the mic and ask? Hey, it's uh, Marshall. And, um, you know, I, Fortunately, I, I do know sort of the, the difference, but I know uh, a lot of times I've, I've seen the term solutions journalism and enterprise journalism sort of used interchangeably. And so I wanted to hear from you all, like, what, were, what was like your definition of like the difference of it? So I, I would say I don't really see a difference because you could do solution journalism in almost any way like if there's breaking news and there happens to be a solution journalism structure that you already have in your lap and that it's valid like you could bring that up within your your, your quick reporting um but all enterprise reporting is not solution journalism at all right you could do enterprise reporting that's problem focused you could do enterprise reporting that's hero worship um so yeah i don't think putting it as a dichotomy is is fair it's just Two things that overlap sometimes and don't overlap other times. And a good example to prove that is just going through the story tracker and seeing the different types and structures of these stories. And I did drop a handy dandy uh, piece that SJN did, I think just here in December. That's like a super simple primer that includes the four pillars of solutions journalism. I thought that was uh, you know, really useful for myself at least. Um, I see a question from Jillian. Did you want to 
Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so I feel like some of the, the uh, roadblocks I face with my solution, well, I, like I said, I had, I did a solutions uh, journalism piece last year and um, I, I want to, I don't know, I don't want to say that I'm, I mean, I don't want to say that I'm bad at social media. It's just that I, I am sometimes hesitant to tweet about very policy dense stories because I don't want to make it, I don't want to dumb it down anymore. Or I don't want to make it too simplified. Like you were like, and, but I also realize that that's how a majority of people are getting their news these days. And that's how you get attention of lawmakers is by tweeting. And um, I just want to know, like, how do I get past that concern of like, well, what if this is like going to, to be like, what if I have to like, what if it's going to have to put it way out of context on social media and what are good ways to like still make it like like meaty and um and not too condensed um and and ways that people will pay attention and like actually like um without it you know without without it being like hey look at this you know or like i don't know that's that's not a very straightforward question but like <laughs> Uh, my, my short answer is, mm. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> because like different audiences are different. Like I wish I could tweet about, um, I don't know, the complexities of civil war in Ethiopia, but I can't do that in one tweet. <laughs> like, you know, like, and that's problem focused anyway. Um, I feel like it just takes up the rest of my day too. And I have a lot of other things that I have to get to. I can't just be tweeting all day. And so, but I know that that's what a lot of people, like, that's just what a lot of our industry is now. So maybe that's just a larger question, but in regards to solution journalism stories, like if you have any resources of like, Hey, here's a good thread that someone made of a story that they did that, you know, people mm -hmm. paid attention to and it, and it wasn't too like, um, the tweets weren't too like ridiculous, ridiculous. <laughs> sensation. I don't want to say sensationalized, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Or over promise or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I would say we may have resources on the website, but on our blog, I'll double check and I'll send it in a follow-up email. My short answers are these three things. One, just like headlines don't over promise in the tweet. You can't have a new nuanced tweet and really good headlines spark curiosity, right? How, um, a state with high gun ownership and low gun violence is Hawaii. So like what makes Hawaii special with this, like how did they do that? Like that's a one tweet and a link. And people will be like, wait, what high gun ownership, low gun violence? They might be curious. I mean, there is probably a much more articulate way to say that, but that curiosity may spark someone's interest. Um, another note is imagery. And I could like, I have a multimedia background and I dislike when someone does a solution story, but the, the image is problem focused. Uh, and I could go into a whole rant about that. But the point I bring up with those two, the headline and the image is this. If people are tuning out on news because it makes them feel bad, it's depressing, they already know the world is going to hell. <laughs> if you have a problem focused headline or tweet and a problem focused image, they have no reason to, to click into your story because they think they're getting the same thing. Right, so it's important that your image and your headline match the the contents of the story. And if the contents of the story says, "Hey, this is the exception to the rule. This is what you don't know. This is interesting. Let make sure your headline does that. Don't double down and do more gloom." And there's lots of studies about that, which I didn't bring today, but keep that in mind. Uh, and if you think about a Twitter thread, maybe have a four tweet Twitter thread with each quality. Maybe that's what you want to do. How is Denver succeeding at this? Um, this is what <laughs> this is where Denver is. This is where New York is. Um, they did something different. They actually have a Spanish language program, but it's not perfect just yet. Read more. Maybe that's a good way to just structure all your tweets. One line from the story, each that supports those four pillars, and send out. So you're just copy and pasting a thing you already wrote on a link. Give that a try. Maybe it will work. Maybe it won't work. Let me know. <laughs> okay, I realize it is uh, 12.57. So just to squeeze one more in, does anybody have a quick question? Or Kevin, do you want to leave them with something?
profound. I'm putting you on the spot for being profound. <laughs> To me, this is profound. We'll see what people think, but I think it would be profoundly excellent if you follow Solutions Journalism Network, you know, on Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. They are really good stewards of their social accounts. Um, and the way that they talk about Solutions Journalism is very accessible. Um, also the newsletter, I dropped a link in the chat. Um, they have a few different offerings um, on the newsletter. And again, they, they really have that conversational tone um, sort of real world examples. And I definitely find that sort of the work they put out there is a nice baseline that helps guide me in a variety of work that I do every day. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you all for attending this very much crash course in social journalism. If you want to do a more specific deeper dive, feel free to reach out to me. I have no problem hosting a session for you all uh, or for your specific newsroom, or maybe just you, maybe you just have something coming up this week and you want to like bounce some ideas off of me, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to our gracious host. And uh, again, thank you for inviting us. Mm -hmm.